Hey everybody, welcome. My name is Raina Marie Paukar and you are tuned in to another episode of Young Black Equestrians. I am. I am. I am. I am a young. I am a young. I am a young. I am. And I am a young. Black. A young black. Young black. A young black. Black. Black equestrian. 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 Black equestrian. Equestrian. Black equestrian. Equestrian. I'm a young black equestrian. I am a young black equestrian. <laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Young Black Equestrians with your hosts, Abriana Johnson and Caitlin Gooch. Today on the podcast, we have Raina, and I'm so excited to hear her story, hear about the work that she's done with racehorses, and just collect all the gems that she can drop for us today. So welcome to the show, Raina. Thank you. Thank you both, Abriana and Caitlin. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So we always ask everyone to just start off by telling us about themselves, where you, what you do, where you're located, and kind of your backstory. All right, the dreaded question. Tell me about yourself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, well, I live in Ohio right now, and I would say as far as my current discipline, it's multidiscipline. Um, I ride, you know, hunt seat, but I also like to do a lot of dressage. Um, classical dressage with the horses that I work with. And I also like to do a lot of groundwork. So it's really a combination of those three things. And if I ever get my horse um, quiet enough, I love to go on some trail rides. <laughs> so we're, we're aspiring to, to do that this summer. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Trail life, trail life. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that is cool. So how did you get into horses in the first place were you kind of born into it or you just had you know, fall in your lap like how did that even start so I'm a first generation equestrian um, my grandfather was actually dating this woman at the time and she was riding horses she was into horses and one day she took me to a barn when she was having lessons she was right she rode saddle seat I went there <laughs> I saw horses and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is, wow. They were just, um, oh, they just captivated me that the minute I stepped into the barn and I saw her riding and I just got to interact with the horses, I just fell in love right there. And um, so um, as a gift, I got some lessons. You know, my mom was like, all right. So my, I first started out with saddle seat, but, uh, but then I saw some people jumping horses and I was like, that's where it's at for me. <laughs> And so I switched tech over, you know, to hunters. Um, and I did that for several years. I think I was, I was like eight or yeah, I was like eight years old when I started riding mm -hmm. and, um, I did shows and everything. I, you know, I competed at some, uh, rated shows and that was mm, good and bad. You know, I had some, some good times and I had some really crappy times, <laughs> you know, to be honest, that's when I, kind of realized I'm different and why are people looking at me why are people making comments about my hair see this hair is straightened right now <laughs> but you know when I was showing and everything you know my mom my mom god bless you mom she didn't really know how to do my hair like I had my grandmother who used to do my hair because I'm mixed so when it was just me and mom it was just you know do the best you can <laughs> um and so yeah those were some of the experiences that I had mm -hmm. um with showing I did that competitively for several years um and I just I just got tired of it you know I was it was really it was mostly you know white people honestly at that time and um where I lived it was very money-based mm -hmm. I guess it still is mm -hmm. um but then I was different on top of it you know I was I didn't I didn't I wasn't white passing and my horse was a big Appaloosa <laughs> and I was in these classes with these cute little dapple gray ponies and <laughs> these girls were pigtails and, you know, we definitely stood out and, um, you know, I just got, got tired of the, the politics with the, with the horse shows and, you know, I took a break. I never stopped riding my horse, but I got out of that whole uh, show world mm -hmm. and, um, and then I went off to college and then um, 
I got to see racehorses for the first time. And I was like, <gasps> you know, and it was diverse. There was all kinds of everybody from everywhere. And I was like, oh my God, um, it was just, that was it. I got sucked in, you know, happily, gratefully. Um, I broke babies. I learned how to break thoroughbreds on the farm in Ocala. Then from there, I galloped for several years, many, many years. And then uh, I got my jockey license and uh, I started riding. So, wow. Yeah. Wow, that is definitely a uh, interesting trajectory. Um, when you went to college, what did you major in, or like, like what did you want to be when you grew up? What was yeah your thought process behind that? Well, before I went to college, I always wanted to do something with horses, but honestly, showing really soured me from that. I would I thought that that was all there was, and. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want to be around these kind of people. I don't want to feel how I felt, mm -hmm. you know? So I didn't know that there was anything else for me, what else was available. So when I went to college, I thought international business, I was really interested in that. Um, and well, I studied that for a while, <laughs> much to my parents and family's dismay. I dropped out of college to learn how to gallop and ride um, because it was a uh, I was more passionate about that at the time. You know, that was, that was really what I wanted to do and what I was looking for. Um, so that's, yeah, that's how that went. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. It's always interesting to see how we have plans for our life. And then, you know, something shiny comes along and it's like, I'd rather do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I still do do things with business um uh, you know I develop products and whatnot mm -hmm. um so it's still important I still do a lot of studying and self-development but at that point in my life I mean I'm in my 40s now but I was you know 18 at the time 19 and um yeah I was still fit and strong I didn't really have injuries and <laughs> and whatnot at that time mm -hmm. so um I, I just went for it I went for it I mean there was a lot of uh there was pushback because it wasn't on the racetrack. It wasn't even um, a racial barrier anymore. It was a gender barrier to become a jockey. There was lot, there's lots of women who gallop, but at that time there weren't as many uh, female riders. There still really aren't that many female riders, but you know, especially you know, we're talking more than 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did that lead up to what you are doing now? So let's see, I think it was like a couple of years into galloping, I started recognizing um, there were racehorses that they couldn't run anymore, they couldn't train anymore, but they would be perfectly suitable, um, you know, to go on to a second career as a hunter or a jumper or um, a low level eventer or something. And at the time, this was like 1998, 99, there really weren't um, many ex racehorse rescues at that time. It was mostly people just doing it on their own and I was one of them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I did end up adopting one horse. I just loved him so much. Uh, he was a horse that I galloped and it happened to be one day, um, I didn't go there. I got a phone call because this, this was on the farm and um, they said, hey, uh, you know, this, this horse, he can't, he's not gonna make it. Um, you want to take him because we don't know what to do with him. We, you know, they were going to put him down. So I was like, oh my God, no, 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 I'll take him. I'll take him, you know. Meanwhile, I'm broke at this point. So I was literally, <laughs> I'm literally living off of ramen noodles so that I could make sure that this horse has board and, and vet bills covered. And oh my goodness, everything. Luckily, um, I had a great vet that I worked with to rehab this horse. And that was really my first step into um, uh, rehabbing x race horses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he went on to be a therapy horse. So he assisted, uh, people with, uh, PTSD and, you know, and other em emotional issues. And, um, you know, even some differently able children were able to ride him. So he ended up having a great career. He was such a sweet horse. Um, mm -hmm. I just, that was, that was it for me. That was more rewarding than anything. And, uh, from there, I went on to learn more things about equine therapy. I became certified as, um, equine massage therapist, I got certified in PEMF, um, kinesio tape and laser. So I kind of learned all these things to really assist with the horses that I was working with. In addition to 
vet care and, uh, and retraining them. So, wow. yeah, yeah. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, a lot of experience under your belt. Do you think that when the, at the time that you entered college, um, say if you didn't go to college, would this career path have been an option for you at that time? Like, how would you have entered that? Like, was that, I mean, cause I know you said that not, not a lot of people were rehabbing. They were mm-hmm. trying to kind of doing it on their own, but you know, like today we are definitely encouraging kids to look into different um, horse careers. So yes. I'm just wondering like, how did that look for you at that time? At that time, I had no idea <laughs> any of this existed. Mm-hmm. It was just a, like a divine path to just, mm-hmm. you know, that opened up for me and, you know, I just embraced it. Um, I just kept an open mind and just kept moving forward with, you know, what felt right. And, um, you know, just more and more horses came into my life. And, uh, you know, I guess it was a natural progression. But now there are so many more options for kids. I mean, I would love to have my own place and, and just have lots of kids come and ride free of charge just so they could experience the gift of horses. Because, you know, when I was in school... <laughs> honestly the only thing that kept me focused and straight was knowing that I have riding lessons I have a you know I have a horse to, a lesson horse that I get to ride and you know that kept me focused kept my grades up and um kept me on task and I, I just think that could be beneficial for so many kids and mm-hmm. you know now that there's more programs I think there, there could be much more but obviously there's you know financial uh considerations with that mm-hmm. but uh but, but yeah, I mean, at the time, like, I didn't know it was even a, an option. Yeah. 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 That exposure is so like key. And, and, you know, mm-hmm. now when we're in the position where we can facilitate that exposure at an earlier age, like mm-hmm. you can just give people the options, give kids the options that they have before yeah. they get tens of thousands of dollars into debt (laughs) right so um right yeah (laughs) yeah super important Um, yeah so what is one of the biggest challenges you've faced in the horse industry and kind of what did you learn from that situation well honestly the very first issue was uh was you know implicit bias when I was a child I um that was the first ish I just just never sat right with me like I didn't know what was I really thought something was wrong with me um and you know where I grew up I grew up in a city like it was really diverse there were mixed kids like me and my best friend was mixed um I had friends of all different colors and races and you know it it was very diverse, but in a, you know, my barn life was nice. Everyone at the barn was cool. But once I got to those horse shows, oh man. <laughs> so that was my first real, I guess, hurdle. But I'm grateful for it because I, you know, I learned a lot from it. And I think that in a weird way, it put me on the right path in my life. Mm-hmm. You know? So that was the first one. And then probably the next one was, you know, when I got to to racing and, you know, being a woman Mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of fighting for mounts, you know, for for guys that I believed were a little less talented than I was, uh, but they would, you know, get the mount, you know, (laughs) even though I would gallop the horse in the morning, uh, there would be a change last minute and they put this guy on and stuff like that, you know? So that was, that was uh, a lot to overcome, but, uh, but I still rode. I just, you know, I did my thing. I did the best I could. I, you know, I worked hard and um, I took it where I wanted to take it, you know, so I was comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I'm proud of you for not giving up. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Thank you. It was, I'm not going to lie. I mean, when I was a kid, it was, it was, uh, it was hard, you know, it was like a very, very strange place to be. (laughs) Mm-hmm. very long very lonely <laughs> but I love the horses you know so yeah what is a common misconception people have about rehabbing racehorses oh that they're crazy that uh uh 
they don't know how to do so many things that they just assume racehorses, uh, they just don't know anything. And I, I like to, to explain to people that racehorses are much more experienced than your average show horse because racehorses see so, so much. I mean, they have lived a life <laughs> before they retire. Mm -hmm. They've seen all kinds of things on the racetrack. I mean, from uh, loading into uh, loading into the gates, uh, you know, cars, people, noise, crowds, um, you know, there's so much stimuli at the track. There's so much that they're exposed to and um, that they have to handle, mm -hmm. um, you know, in addition to their training and everything. Um, I just, I think people don't give race horses or ex race horses enough credit as to what kind of exposure that they've had and what kind of, you know, worldly experience that they've had because a horse show to an ex race horse is going to be a piece of cake compared to life at the track. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it from the people, the noise, the, you know, flags, like mm -hmm. trash bag. <laughs> oh yes. Trash, trash bags or plastic bags rolling across the track. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Geese, you know, there's for some <laughs> reason at every racetrack I've ever been to, there's always the geese. And they walk, walk across the track, you know, of course, while you're galloping or something, that's like, oh my gosh. So, I mean, yeah, there's just lots. <laughs> that is so crazy. Has, has your kind of career path in the racing industry, like allowed you to travel a lot? Oh, I've been very nomadic. <laughs> uh, when I was riding, I, I lived in several, several states. I have not really ridden outside of the United States, but I've, I've ridden in uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Massachusetts, Florida. Um, and I can't, I, I think that's it. I'd have to go back and look, but <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've lived a lot of places and, uh, you know, I rode a lot of places. You, you go wherever you can get the mounts, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. want to go out the country? Oh, I, I kind of, I live in the country now and I, I love it actually. Um, I live in Ohio and uh, where I live, it's pretty, pretty country. I mean, I got my horse right down the street. I'd love to have my horse with me, obviously, but um, property laws and whatnot. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I love the country. Yeah. I meant outside of the United States. Oh, have I been outside of the U.S.? Also, do you want to go out? I've been to Peru, Canada. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely um, love to do equestrian vacations and I'd love to go to Africa and ride and visit in general. Um, I'd like to go to New Zealand and ride. So I have aspirations. I haven't been there yet, but, but, um, but yeah, only a couple places, but I got to ride in Peru, but eh. <laughs> yeah, it's probably one of those like manned things where like the horses they you could be on them or not be on them and they're gonna walk the same way exactly exactly right they're just like all right i'll just sit back i know what i'm doing yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're going this way <laughs> yeah right right so what vision do you have kind of for the future of the work that you're doing oh oh i have so many goals um lay them out we're here for goals goodness yeah <laughs> I have a lot of goals I mean first I have a couple of products that I developed um I, I developed something called the drop and slow which is like a equine slow feeder um I could just show you right here I have it I don't know if yeah. you can see it yeah um, it helps a lot with you know slowing them down because my horse uh <laughs> he uh he bolts his grain you know he's kind of piggy so um, I came up with this because nothing else on the market had worked. So I developed this. Um, I'm having a bucket made for this specifically. Um, so it's deeper than most of the feed tubs on the market. So it'll help horses that like to sling the grain out of there and it'll slow them down. So it's two problems solved in you know, one, uh, one product. Mm -hmm. So I have that going and I'm hoping, you know, I want to have my own farm. I want to do my own rescue um, for X-Race horses because I get a lot of people who, you know, they want to 
give their horse to me because they know that I'll work hard to find a good home for it and I'll be right by the horse. But I don't have a facility for that. You know, I board. You know how if you board a horse, you know how expensive that is. So, and, and I like to take my time when I work with horses, um, especially, you know, the X-race horses. I, I don't like to rush them. You know, I like to give them time off. I like to let them be a horse. Um, so I really love to have my own place so that I can retrain and rehab horses really the way that, uh, that I feel is the right way to, you know, to do by them, to give them the best chance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one goal. And then, you know, of course, if I had a place, I'd love to have um, kids who are interested in horses who, you know, don't have the financial means or ability. I'd love to just have a couple real nice <laughs> ponies or something that they could come and learn on. And, um, and, and I would love to do that. I would, I would just love that because I, I think every kid deserves to have um, the ability or the chance to, to get to experience how wonderful horses is and how it can, you know, change, change your life. Yes. Yeah. 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 So Caitlin, were you going to say something? <laughs> I was just gonna say, it just sounds like you know we are we're here. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely my life mission to just keep exposing kids to horses and doing it for free, um, mm -hmm. making sure that they have a safe and positive experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that because honestly, I don't know where I would be if, if it wasn't for horses. I have no idea what I would be doing. <laughs> Probably something not so great. <laughs> <laughs> about like being in school like that was my reason for keeping my grades up and we had horses but I couldn't go you know like if I was getting trouble at school <laughs> right yeah so I want to I want to rewind it back a little bit mm -hmm. to drop and slow oh okay. sure sure tell us about this I mean you told us a little bit but this journey to developing a product because we have been um in conversation with people who are trying to develop products mm -hmm. and they have told us like it's impossible so we've we've kind of been like like how is this a secret thing like it's a secret secret sauce how does this even happen so can you like walk us through that journey how do you even get something like that manufactured oh sure where do I start? Okay. <laughs> it's because it is. No, it, I was exactly where, what you're talking about. That's where I was, mm -hmm. but I am very tenacious. And I was like, I am going to get this thing to market. I'm going to do it. Okay. It's three years later. It took a long time, but the first thing to do is to start with, with your idea and to try to get uh, some market valid validity, like, um, to throw it out to consumers in a way without exactly exposing what your product is because if it's proprietary if it's something that's new or you know a, a redesign of a product that's already existing but it's something that you can patent because i have multiple patents pending on this and that was a whole other <laughs> whole nother thing but we'll, i'll get to that I'll, I'll just kind of gloss over it but the first thing is you want to prove that there's a problem that you can solve with your issue and you know, there's multiple ways to do that. Um, you could have a prototype or a 3D rendering, or you could just do a simple survey um, and, and just throw it out there. Hey, like what I did was I surveyed people about the existing slow feeders on the market and I figured out what didn't work. I mean, I knew it didn't work for me, but that's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to make sure it was like a universal issue. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And then it took me a year of uh, prototyping and rendering, because uh, I found you find somebody who can do CAD work for you. So you find a CAD engineer. There's plenty of them on Fiverr, or mm -hmm. um, uh, you just you know Google uh, CAD engineer. And um, I worked with someone, and it took a few months to prototype this, and then I had it 3D printed uh, multiple times, <laughs> and I just kept testing and testing and testing and trying with my horse, who was like the best and worst uh, candidate because <laughs> it was really for horses like him. He like he first the first design I had, he kept pitching it out. He kept pitching it out. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to kill this horse because he kept cracking the prototypes. And it was like a hundred bucks. <laughs> so, OK, we, we, we got past that. I, you know, 
I got past it to the final design and it worked on multiple horses, like hundreds. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that. And then um, I did go to a lawyer um, to find out about um, patenting my product. That's not something everybody does or has to do, but I, I wanted to make sure that um, protect one, it. Yeah, protect it. One, that it was eligible. Uh, so you have to do a thing called prior art search to make sure that your invention doesn't exist already because uh, sometimes they do. Um, and then once you do a prior art search, you can just go on Google patents and just kind of like type in the idea of what your uh, idea or invention does if it's a, if it's a physical product. Um, and then you can go from there. You just kind of search through there. The other option is you pay uh, a, an attorney who specializes in patents you would pay them to do the search for you. And it's not cheap, it, started, it starts at like a thousand dollars, but that lets you know, hey, my idea is valid or it's already out there. You know, um, I advise doing it the cheap way first, <laughs> yeah. just to make sure. Um, and then, you know, move forward from there um, and then have your, your lawyer do the work for you and file everything properly. Mm -hmm. um, and then, the next phase is uh, manufacturing. Once you have a, a CAD file or 3D file um, of your actual product that works, then you would find a manufacturer. You would have to find somebody who can make the mold for you because I highly, highly recommend that if you have a physical product that you wanna to bring to market, you source your own mold manufacturer. Don't go through a sourcing company because let me tell you, they're going to tack on ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars profit mm -hmm. just for them, just to put in their pocket for work that you can do yourself. So I, I would recommend looking for a, you know, steel mold manufacturer. You can do it in the United States, or you can do it in China. Um, I did my mold in China because it's cheaper, and a lot of the U.S. manufacturers that I was going to go through, they were going to source the mold from China anyway, <laughs> and then just bring it here. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Um, so. <laughs> That's, that's kind of the, the rough phases of it. Uh, and then marketing. And then um, I also trademarked the name, uh, Drop and Slow. It's a registered trademark. I got that done. So I, I recommend if you have a product that's unique, you, uh, you find a name that's unique, that the domain's available. Oh, because I want to give you a quick little of what happened to me on Drop and Slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, 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 follow, I, um, I filed the initial trademark. And four days later, somebody bought it, bought the website because they saw that I had filed the trademark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they bought it price and priced it for nine. You know, luckily I don't really need the, uh, I don't really need the website. I am talking to retailers who are gonna stock this anyway. So I don't really need, uh, you know, actually dropandslow.com. I can just do drop and slow feeder. It doesn't matter. I don't really need the, the exact website, but for ease of, you know, that's one mistake, I would say, um, do that. So I have other products that I'm working on. And that was the first thing I did was I looked to see that the domain is available, pay the $12 and just, you know, buy it and secure your name and then, um, you know, trademark it. Yeah. Highly recommend doing that. Yeah, the $12 investment is so worth it. Right, it's, it's, it's not worth the headache of, uh, you know, dealing with someone, you know, who wants to charge $1,000 for just uh, squatting on your name, you know? Right. So luckily for me, it's not that important. It's not a deal breaker for me because I'm going to house this under another brand anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, for future reference, because some people just do one product. So if this is your, you know, your million dollar product, <laughs> Mm -hmm. get your get your website and um you know make sure you do a trademark search that you know it's uh it's available because it'll say no records um and that's usually the best way to do that and then hire a lawyer to actually trademark it for you because i tried to do it on my own I, mm -mm, just pay the money <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth the headache yeah. 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 <laughs> How long do you think it took for you to get that trademark back? This one. Okay. So when I filed the trademark, um, I forgot what it was called. I wasn't actually using the trademark. It was intent to use. Mm -hmm. So it took mm, a year, about a year, maybe a little more than a year. It wasn't that long, but if you're already using the name, so say you already bought the domain and you have even a prototype 
if you have a prototype of your product and you sell it to somebody, uh, you're using the trademark. So usually if you've had some sales and you're already using the name, it's usually it's quicker. You can have, you know, six to eight months, I would say. I have a couple more that are pending. I'll let you know. But it's, I mean, I've had, I know other people who have done it. Um, and it's, it's a shorter time that you'll actually get that nice little circle with the R in it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. Um, so what about the patent? How, what's the time frame on that? Oh, they can take forever. I, I mean, <laughs> really, they can take a really long time. Um, I have multiple patents pending. So if you're doing a design patent and the patent just protects the way that your product looks and not the way that it functions, that's, a, that's a, what you would use a design patent for. Mm -hmm. Those are generally like 18 months about, you know, about 18 months. Um, you know, if you have the, you, a good lawyer who has all your paperwork in order and your line drawings and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, utility patents take a lot longer. So utility patents are based on the functionality of your product, what your product does. And if you have a good lawyer who can, um, uh, who can really give a good distinction as to how your product is different, um, why, you know, why it's different and what it does, um, that can take 18 months minimum or longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just general, general, but yeah. design patents are easier, faster, you know, utility patents, they're, they're a lot longer, but um, you know, it depends on what kind of protection you need. Right. Right. So with all this information that you have shared, <laughs> yeah. How did you stay the course for something that takes this long? Like how did, what was that continuous driver? Because a lot of people would be like 18 months. I don't want to do that. Like the time's not going to pass anyway. Because I believe in my product. I know it works and I know it's going to help some horses. It's going to help some owners. Um, I just believe in it. I just like, it's just this underlying feeling of, I know this is going to make money. I know this is going to change lives for horses and owners. It's going to bring ease. Um, I've already validated it with retailers before I brought it to market. I said, I created a simple little uh, sell sheet about the product before it was even a product. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, said, Hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? And I had a couple of really big retailers interested in it. I approached some a uh, couple companies about licensing it, but that didn't work out, um, and that's fine. I, I, I bring it bring it to market myself. So you got to really believe in your product, um, and just and just think: is this is this really going to solve problems for people? Because if it's going to solve problems, everybody's looking for something that's going to make their life easier. It's better to just wait the eighteen months. You don't even have to wait until eighteen months to start selling your product. Right. Um, you know, just have it in place. Just have it, have it pending. It's fine. Um, and you don't even have to have your trademark registered. As long as you got it in, you know, filed and you got that little TM, mm -hmm. that's enough to deter people too. Um, yeah. And uh, that's all you really need. You have your website, you have your trademark in place and um, a patent if it's needed. And then, you know, you go to production and you start, start selling, um, whether it's through a retailer or you do it yourself. Um, what yeah. difference does it make if it's three months or 18 months? Because in two years from now, when it's still not available or somebody else brings it to market, you're going to be kicking yourself. You're going to, you know, don't live with the regret. Just go for it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could yeah. have suggested this in a group chat because there was like this long um, conversation in the comments because someone was looking for a slow feeder for their horse. Mm -hmm. And like literally everybody was suggesting extra large, like slow feeders, but they were made for dogs. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I'm, I tried all the other equine slow feeders and for, they didn't do anything for my horse. So that's why I was like, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And another thing too, is I, I worked at an equine hospital and there were a lot of horses that had colic surgery and, you know, had to kind of make sure they weren't, you know, eating the grain too fast. And, um, it just kept coming, you know, so I had to, I had to do it. 
mm -hmm. kept popping in my head. I'd be washing the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> like slow feeder slow feeder what are you doing to make your slow feeder yeah and it just kept coming so I just kept going for it even though it, I mean like I said it's taking me three years to to get to this point um so I mean it'll be I, I sell the tops they fit a lot of the feed buckets on the market right now mm -hmm. but I was like mm, I can make a better feed bucket too mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so that's that's what I'm in the process of doing so and I'm sure yeah. now that you've gotten this first kind of complete process out of the way, additional, you know, supporting accessories, like it's it, like it comes easier for you because you've already done the process. Yeah. And I mean, that's the thing is if you have an idea and you have just you want to create a product yourself, um, the only way you're going to learn is by doing, I mean, you can have a million, you can, I mean, you, it's good to have a mentor. Um, I didn't really get a mentor until later on. Mm -hmm. um, when I hit a wall, I was like, what do I do next? You know, and I really, I wasn't sure what to do or how to go about everything. Cause there's also legal stuff. You know, you got to make sure you have product insurance and, you know, general liability insurance, all those kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, which would be great to have a mentor for, but, um, I want to say the most, the hardest part is, is, is learning about it. Mm -hmm. Implement, implementing the work is not that hard. Um, once you, once you kind of find a rhythm and everything starts falling into place, but you know, the first steps are to do your prior art search to make, you know, go on Google patents and make sure your product didn't exist a hundred years ago and just no one's making it anymore or something. And someone still has the patent on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and the trademark website, uh, and then, like I said, patents, if you need to, because you can also do something called a provisional patent. So if you don't have a lot of money, um, but you have maybe a thousand dollars or $2,000, um, that you can invest It's a write-off. So make sure you have a business, <laughs> um, you can get a, a provisional patent mm -hmm. and that can protect you for one year until mm -hmm. you file for your other patents. So you can be selling your product. And be and you know and have some to have some protection you know peace of mind and then also with the provisional patent it gives you validation if your product is selling and you've made a nice profit and you've covered all your expenses and making the profit then you know it's worth it to buy yourself a utility patent or invest in that design patent so um uh, you know that's just another option for for people yeah and then they'll have specimens to send in because you have to do that too if you're using it mm-hmm Yep. That's wow. That's crazy. I didn't even know that we were going to talk about this. <laughs> I guess I guess someone needed to hear it, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it's so good. You know, there's so many people who have great ideas. And like you said, I mean, education is the barrier to a lot of this. It's like, mm -hmm. I Google this information. There's so many advertisements for people trying to <laughs> sell yes. you something and it's like all I asked was how do I build this thing you know how do right. I how do I you know and so it's just so hard sometimes to weed out the bs um on the internet so thank you for sharing that because oh, I'm sure my pleasure I'm there. always happy to share because you know the worst thing I I I, I hate to see inventors and people who have original ideas get ripped off and there's so many companies, I never fell prey to any of that, but, um, but so many people do be, just because they, they, they want it so bad, but then they don't know any better. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to, you know, share with people whatever knowledge I have so they don't make the same mistakes that I, that I made, um, you know, yeah. why? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 that is awesome. So what advice, you've given a lot already, oh. <laughs> what, what advice would you give aspiring equestrians or since we have this new angle, aspiring business owners who are trying to, you know, just make something shake? Yeah. Okay. I guess I'll start with equestrians first. Um, just, I mean, it's going to sound so cliche, but obviously, I mean, the biggest thing is, is uh, believe in yourself. And, you know, don't pay attention to negativity or other people getting in your way or making you feel less for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. 
because you have value, you are worth it, you are capable, um, and horses are for everybody. So I would say go for whatever, whatever lights you up with horses, just, uh, just go for it. And the same for business, I guess. Um, I think horses are much easier, actually. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Horses, you know, right. horses just love you, you know, they love you, um, or, well, or they don't. <laughs> but they let you know. Yeah, they're, they're no. authentic. <laughs> you know, horses aren't going to lie to you. Yeah. Um, and as far as business, um, if you have an idea or a business idea, now is the perfect time. Um, there are a lot of actually free resources. If you are an inventor or if you're a business person and you have something um, you know, you want to bring to life um, the best time to be an entrepreneur, um, set up your own business. There's lots of tax advantages. Um, there's lots of ways you can learn how to play the game. Uh, I think a really good, uh, a free resource is score.org. Um, there's a lot, I, I know I found a really great mentor from there. I still talk to him. Mm -hmm. um, he's really coached me through some tough times. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and, and they're free. I mean, there's a lot of coaches that'll say, Oh, $5,000 for every other week <laughs> and for a month. Um, I mean, I'm not saying they're not, they don't have value, but why, <laughs> right. You know, as mm -hmm. long as you know, when you have experience and you pay it forward, um, and you help somebody else who's, who's behind you, you lift them up. Yeah. Just like somebody helped lift you up. And I don't think the dollar amount should be involved in that. Um, so I would recommend score. You can find a mentor um, for free. That's done what you've done and mm -hmm. it will help you progress and avoid pitfalls, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Just go for it. I like, I like them. And the thing that I went to my mentor about, it got resolved with their help. So I would yeah. definitely back that recommendation. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know I would have made some, <laughs> I mean, it would have made some very costly mistakes um, if I didn't have a really good mentor in place. Um, right. So, right. Yeah. Right. That's cool. So our last kind of interview question is uh, what does the word equestrian mean to you? A horse lover who puts horsemanship first, somebody who loves the horse above anything else and is willing to um, do whatever it takes to ensure the horse's well-being um, and guide them and support them. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it means to me is someone who, who loves the animal it's fun to ride and all that and train. I mean, obviously we, you know, we all love that, but um, I think being a good horseman is, uh, is being an equestrian. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I would agree. All right. It's time for the Derby round. <laughs> derby round. You answer with the first thing that comes to mind, either or, um and then the yeah the first thing that comes to mind i said that backwards but whatever you get what i'm saying all right so are you ready <laughs> okay okay <laughs> all right so english or western oh english solids or spots spots bays or grays oh bay bay brown tack or black tack oh <laughs> mm. Black tack goes with everything. Yeah. <laughs> Sponge or curry brush? Oh, I need both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> um, shod or barefoot? Barefoot. Mm -hmm. Bumper pull or gooseneck? Mm. I can't drive a gooseneck, so I'll say bumper pull. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> A rope halter or a nylon halter? Hmm. I have both. I guess rope. Mm -hmm. Wood fence or electric fence? Oh, wood fence. Yeah. What is your favorite piece of barn equipment? Oh, man, my hoof pick. <laughs> my hoof pick. That's a good one. What is your favorite piece of tack? <clears throat> my cabazon mm -hmm. 
And oh, can you explain what that is for people who may not? Oh, oh, Kavasan is like a lunch, uh, a lunch halter. It has three rings. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I use that for double lunging and long lining. Mm -hmm. And when was the last time you fell off? Oh, oh, it's been a while. Uh, Knock on all the woods. Yeah, it's been a couple of years, but that's because I'm not really galloping that much. But when you gallop, all oh, those odds, <laughs> it's like, you know, every few months you're falling off. So yeah. it's, been, it's, been, it's been a minute, which means I'm due, which now you're scaring me. Thank you. If money was no object, what is one horse-related purchase you would buy? I would buy a gigantic farm with a lot of acreage and pasture so I could just buy, not buy, buy, adopt a bunch of little horses that uh, nobody wants or they're not rideable and just let them be pasture pets and live out the rest of their life happily. That's what I would do. Yeah, mm -hmm. same. Same. It is, it is a necessity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, that is it. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, we actually connected in a clubhouse room. Yeah. Like after the after party on Instagram. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm just really happy. I haven't even really been on Clubhouse in a very long time, but I'm just <sighs> happy that we were able to connect and get you on the show. Me too. Thank you both. Thank you, ladies, so much. I'm so grateful. I had a great time. <laughs> yeah, we did and, um, too. Yeah, you ladies are awesome. So thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Let um let our, our people know where they can find you um on the interwebs if they want to learn more about um dropping dropping slow. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got it. Um, well, if you want to learn more about the slow feeder, that's dropandslowfeeder.com. If you want to find me, um, you can find me at highvibeequine.com. Um, I have some resources I'm putting together for um, x race horses in particular um, for training and what to look for when you're new to x race horses and you want to look for one to adopt or buy. Um, I'm also going to be putting together my own podcast, which is going to be called the X-Race Horse Resource, where I'm just going to bring on a bunch of people who are experts um, in working with X-Race horses and, um, and, you know, adoption and rehoming. So that's what I'm up to for my, my next big thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the process of putting that together because um, my goal is to make sure that every X-Race horse gets adopted and gets put into a good home. Mm -hmm. that's that's my dream <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well thank you so much we'll be sure to link everything in our show notes and thank you with that we'll let you go all right thank you so much ladies have a great day thanks again thank you. bye bye <laughs> thank you for tuning in to another episode of young black equestrians head over to our facebook or instagram pages and let us know what you thought about that episode Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and have the opportunity to be featured in our next episode. See you next week.